No one's heard the Joseph with the S at the end. So they just, or I'll say, I'm Sean Josephs. And they go, hello, Joseph. It's nice to meet you. (laughs) This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen, and I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. The platform of this podcast was built to help connect the listeners to the brands that they see on the store shelves. But as time has gone on, there's a lot of new entrants to the market, and sometimes we discover that there just isn't a whole lot of substance to a brand. But today's guest, it's the very opposite. I found myself completely enthralled with our guest's history in the culinary world and what he's doing to make his whiskey be one that you can appreciate from the liquid to the blending. Sean Josephs is the co-founder and master blender behind Pinhook. You know, those other bottles with racehorses on the label and different colored wax. Sean talks about getting his start in restaurants, really grinding it out, and eventually working at some of the world's premier establishments and becoming such a decorated wine sommelier that he would be considered famous by those standards. Consider me a bit starstruck by the time this episode is over. But then he finds a new passion in bourbon, and opens up one of the very first American whiskey bars in Brooklyn and eventually left to start Pinhook Bourbon. Sean's passion comes through, and we learn the secret Dakota ring to knowing more about all the Pinhook bottles and what's in store for the future. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Derek Wilkinson, who writes me on fredminnick.com. In my experience with non-alcoholic liquids, adding water results in a drink that lessens the intensity of the flavors without introducing new flavors. However, with high-proof whiskey, adding a small amount of water can introduce new flavors. What is happening with the liquid in the glass that makes this possible? Well, Derek, you have asked one of the great age-old questions about what distillers used to say is opening up the whiskey. There's a couple things that is happening. One is that you are actually able to detect more on your tongue because the alcohol flavor is so intense. Now, in past episodes and on my YouTube channel, I have talked about how a lot of high proof whiskey is actually flawed. And what you can do is you can water it down to 40 proof, and you can start tasting things like the metallic notes, a lot of like green wood notes. Those are not visible when you're at high alcohol strength. In fact, Seagram's used to proof down their whiskey to 20 proof because they felt that that was the best place to find flaws in alcohol. So when you saw something that was like 107 proof from Seagram's, they would do their testing on it at 20 proof. Now, Does that add up? I do not believe that it always does. And the great bourbon hall of famer, Jim Rutledge, formerly with uh, Four Roses, he did not believe in that method. And he came actually from the Seagram's way of life. But anyway, so what my point to that is, is it allows you to taste things that are both good and bad because you're not getting as much intensity on your tongue. That being said... You can still taste a lot of those flavors if you get yourself adapted to cast strength bourbon. I'm a big fan of cast strength bourbon. You don't have to look too far other than my top 100 to see how well cast strength does. And that's not necessarily because it's the alcohol proof. Y'all, I'm telling you, the distillers today put their very best stocks toward the cast strength bourbons. If I watered all those cast strength bourbons that did so well on my top 100, if I watered them down to 100 proof, I can almost guarantee you that they would do very closely to how they performed in the past top 100. That's some of it. There's a chemical change there that allows you to pick up on things due to the alcohol content not being as prolific. There's a few other theories there, like there's more water will kind of break up some of the like higher alcohols that may not necessarily be appealing to you on the cast strength side. So that allows you, it takes away some of the bad. 
in that instance and helps you pick up more of the good. So those are a couple of the theories, but that's a great question, Derek. And one of the best people to talk to about this is actually Andrea Wilson from Michter's. So if you ever find yourself in uh, the Michter's distillery and you see Andrea, Give and say, hey, tell me, tell me about this adding water business to your whiskey. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you want to be like Derek, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the idea, I'll read it on the air. Until next week, cheers. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout, and if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas, Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here talking to somebody we've never had that show before. I know Ryan's had a chance to pick a barrel from well, this, uh, this particular brand at one point in time, but it's something that for us, I've seen it across the shelves, across Kentucky and liquor stores everywhere for for years now. And I've always wanted to kind of learn more about the people and the person and the idea of kind of where this all stemmed from. So I'm really interested to kind of learn more about the background behind Pinhook, because this is something that if you've been in bourbon for a while, well, A, you know that if it's got a horse on it, it's got to sell. So it'll be interesting to kind of see exactly where the brand originated from and kind of how that was all built into it as well. Yeah, I'm excited about this one because I did have the unique and lucky opportunity to do a barrel pick with the Breaking Bourbon guys we did down there in Castle and Key. And it was an interesting one because they put out, they show up and there's like 200 samples out. And I was like, oh boy, what's, but they were all proof down to 40 proof. And we went through and kind of went through whole process of not only did we select a single barrel for us, but we helped we were kind of helping them go through the process of, of selecting a lot of different single barrels that would be available for, you know, for people to, for groups to pick and whatnot. It was a really fascinating experience. And yeah, I just want to learn more about behind, what's going on behind the brand. They've been around for a long time and I, I feel like it's 
We've been way past due on this. <laughs> so I agree. So let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. So today on the show, hailing from New Orleans, Louisiana, we have Sean Josephs of Pinhook. He is the co-founder and master blender. So Sean, welcome to the show. Hey guys, great to be here. I shouldn't say I feel long overdue, but I remember saying to our mutual friend Blake at one point, I was like, what does it take to get on the, what do I need to do to get on the show? <laughs> you just got to bother us. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? <laughs> you just got to contact us. So I, was, I was happy. Yeah, I guess, you know, touche. I guess I maybe if I was interested, I should have reached out, but um, it, it really is great to be here. And as you were saying, you, you, are, you already know something about me, which is any chance I can get other people to do my job for me. You know, I was like, hey, if y'all are going to be at, if y'all are going to be at Castle and Key and you want to pick a barrel, you want to help me grade these other barrels, you know, please. But I do think it actually, that does speak to something that is really important to us, which is transparency, which is really a lot of, you know, obviously we'll get into the story, but a lot of what we do is really based on the idea that I owned a bourbon bar kind of before the whole bourbon thing blew up. And at that time, as you guys know very well, there was a serious lack of transparency. And it was one of the things I found frustrating. So as we'll get into, one of the big things about Pinhook is it's all about being completely upfront about who we are and what we do. And it might not be immediately obvious just based on a name that most people don't know the meaning of and a horse, but those things actually are critical to this idea of complete transparency. Well, I'm happy to start diving into it. So I guess let's let's start there. Like kind of talk about you getting into the booze world. I didn't know you had a had a bar. Was this in Louisiana? Was this in Kentucky? Where was this? No. So well, actually, so I'll start with there's that cliche like bourbon is about stories, right? And I think that usually means like something that happened in the 1870s or, you know, your great grandfather's secret recipe, his mash bill found like in an attic somewhere in a shoe or something like that. But I always like to say my story with Pinhook begins with the way all great stories begin, which is I got fired from a job that I really didn't like. <laughs> um, and, and coincidentally, I was working in advertising as an account manager. My wife, two months prior, this is 2004, had opened a Spanish tapas bar in New York, in West Chelsea on 10th and 22nd called Tia Paul, which I'm going to knock on wood. It's still there 19 years later. Right. And so I hated what I was doing. And I also didn't know what to do because I was in one of those positions in life where I was like, well, I don't want to just another job in the same industry, but I have zero clue what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And just out of a lack of a better alternative and needing a little money, I started working in my wife's restaurant as a food runner which is really the lowest position, you know, really it goes like dishwasher, food runner. So all you're doing is grabbing dishes, you know, from the kitchen and hopefully dropping them at the correct table in front of the correct individual. She didn't even give you the opportunity to be like, let me just go ahead and just bump you up to middle management or just something around there. Like, <laughs> Well, you know, to be fair too, like I had zero experience. Like I hadn't, so at that point I'd never worked in a restaurant really. And so I had one of those amazing experiences where I just loved it. Like I, I'd always played a lot of sports and I don't know if y'all have ever worked in restaurants, but there's something about the camaraderie and the energy and the pace. And the, I liked, I found, I really liked the hospitality, the interactions and just, you know, you show up at the restaurant at 4 PM and you start rolling your silverware and you all have family meal together. And then you go into service and like, before you know it, it's midnight. And I just loved it. And I actually truly had one of those moments where I was like, this is my calling. Like, this is what I meant to do with my, my life. And, and I was 30 at the time. So it took me until I was 30 years old to, to really have that feeling of like, oh, this is what I really want to do. And that almost caused us to get divorced. I don't know if you guys know the restaurant but it, business, but it's like, it's weird to be in the tip pool when your wife owns the restaurant and her <laughs> restaurant did incredibly well. Like her picture was in the New York times and I was just running food with the other food runners and it was awkward and I can laugh about it now, but we really did almost end our marriage. Well, she was going to make so you earn your one, stripes is what it came down to. It's like, you that's gotta, exactly. You right. got to cut your teeth. You got to work in the trenches to kind of understand exactly how everything goes. I mean, I, I think that goes into the, 
the mantra that we've heard from people like Eddie Russell that says, you know, I used to sweep the floors at the distillery because you got to learn everything yep. to be able to do everything. The, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. And and then my thinking, knowing that I couldn't work in her restaurants and knowing that this is what I wanted to do was to try to work in a restaurant at the highest level. Because I was like, I want to see it from the top. I went to work at a restaurant called Chanterelle, which closed in 2008, a fine dining restaurant that had four stars from the New York Times. And the thing I learned immediately, they hired me basically with no experience. And it was terrifying, like all of the steps of service and the sauce spoons and every single thing about it was, I, ne I didn't know anything about it. I had never dined in restaurants like that. And I was terrified. The biggest thing I learned right out of the gate is if you don't know anything about wine and you work in a restaurant like that, you're pretty much useless. <laughs> and the, cause you, you know, you're just like, I literally th thought Bordeaux was a color. I mean, I just, I have to put it to that degree of how little I knew about wine. And so the sommelier there is this guy, Roger de Gorn, who was one of the first Americans to pass the master sommelier. And one of the cool things about restaurants is if you show an interest in wine and you're willing to help the sommelier do inventory, do all this other stuff, you just show an interest, they will immediately take you under their wing. And so obviously for the purposes of this, it would be fun to talk to you all like at greater length because a lot had to happen. But basically I was like, I'm going to become a sommelier. So I'm a certified sommelier from the Court of Master Sommeliers. I have my sommelier certificate from the American Sommelier Association. And I just dug in. I was working late and I would just get home and I had piles and piles of flashcards. And, you know, I guess within two years, I was a sommelier. Sounds easy, but it was a lot of work, a lot of blind tasting groups, you know, all that type of stuff. I then went to work at a restaurant called Per Se, which when I was there was whatever, like the eighth best restaurant in the world. So Thomas Keller, who's the chef of French Laundry, he had opened this restaurant and, you know, this, it was basically redefined what fine dining was at the highest level in New York City. And anybody who was really serious about working in restaurants wanted to work there. And I was able to get a job there as well. Not as a sommelier. Ironically, I had to go back to being a food runner because regardless of what you had done, even if you'd been a sommelier at another restaurant, when you went to work at Per Se, they made everyone started as a food runner because they're like, yeah, you have to know the food. You have to see the kitchen work and everyone starting in the same place. Doesn't matter what you've accomplished prior. And interestingly, I think part of working at Per Se, and this sounds crazy, but it was not uncommon for people to open five and $10,000 bottles of wine on a Tuesday. Oh. And it wasn't even like someone's anniversary, right? And it strikes you when you're, and you get to taste these wines, it strikes you on the one hand that it's cool that you get to taste them, but also the only way you could possibly taste them is either being a server in a restaurant or having tens of millions of dollars. There's basically no in between. And there's something kind of absurd about the lack of accessibility, right? Of these wines, like basically the most people will never taste these wines ever in their lives. And they'll just sit there and wonder, like, I wonder what 1962 Chevrolet Blanc tastes like, you know, I would love it, you know, but you're never going to access it. Right. Do you so, remember like, like a, a, I was going to ask, I was like, uh, do you remember any of those wines that like really stuck out to you? Because if you got to try some of these, you're, you have access to something that, as you said, do you either the very low end or the very high end, there's everybody else that's in the middle that doesn't get it. And so is there anything that you remember that kind of stuck out that said like, wow, this is, this is really something special. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I would love to go back and taste some of those wines again, because now to this day, I don't know if it's because I was developing my palate and I hadn't encountered wines like that. So they were more spectacular and now that I've tasted a lot of those wines, if I were to taste them now, I would be like, yeah, no, it's good. Right. <laughs> it's good, but, but maybe not like $5,000 good. Yeah. yeah. So I was working at Chanterelle. Someone brought in a bottle of 1970 Chateau Palmer and which is a third growth, but is considered to be, you know, at its best on the level of the first growth. There are five wines that are considered to be the five best Bordeaux Chateau. And I just remember smelling this wine and it was it was like 
all the things I'd heard about in the books. It was floral and aromatic, and it was that whole spice box thing they talk about with Bordeaux and the lead pencil and dried flowers. And it was just like leaping out of the glass. So that was kind of like a wine epiphany for me where I was like, holy crap, like it's so crazy that they can take some grapes and make something that is this like complex and ethereal. And that one has stuck with me for sure. I mean, there are many others, but that that's the one I always think about. Well, no, we're having a Christmas party, Kenny. We'll get to <laughs> yeah. no. We're gonna have Sean come. To uh, come though, he's gotta he's gotta bring the wine. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, uh, that's a pretty typical process. Two years for a sommelier is that? A, I don't. You know what? I don't want to brag on myself and be like, oh, I'm like better or faster than other people. I don't know. I just know that you know it's like anything. You're 30, and you're focused, right? And you're in the perfect environment because I'm just surrounded by all these other people. Like I had a fellow food runner who ended up being the head sommelier for all of Daniel Baloud's restaurants, right? I mean, these were people who were talented and ambitious. And then you're just in this environment all the time that's super intense and you're there six days a week and you're just like around it, talking about it, tasting it. And so it's just like the ultimate crash course, you know? So I had a, I had a big advantage. And then, and then what they call, you know, the theory part, you know, that's just as many flashcards as you can jam into your brain, just sitting there with, all right, Loire Valley, here we go, you know, and just cranking them out. I think I've always had a good memory, to be honest. Like that's, it's not a super valuable skill generally, but when it came to that, I'm just like good at memorizing piles of flashcards. So that helped me for sure. Good hidden trick there. So go ahead and kind of continue the story about where you said you were, you know, you, you kind of had the, this opportunity to work there and you were kind of building up after the food runner. Yeah. So I then ended up leaving per se, and I was a sommelier at a really large restaurant in New York called Blue Water Grill. And, you know, so then I was actually a sommelier working in a restaurant in charge of the wine list, changing the, te- you know, in, in charge of training the team, et cetera. And where the bourbon intersected, which was really interesting is a friend of mine, and I really, I can't prove this, but I like to call him Tater Zero because (laughs) he had an insane collection in 2000, in like 2002. He had a black wax maker's mark that had only been bottled for the Japanese market. He had 24 year old Martin Mills. He was buying Blantons from Japan and from England and he just loved it. Like, as you guys know, I mean, there was no Instagram, there was no none of like, there was none of that. It was just a personal passion of his. So I think this is something you all will really be able to appreciate. I'm doing blind tastings. I'm like honing my palate on food and wine. And here's my buddy who's like, here, taste this. 21-year vintage rye from KBD. Or here's their 23-year rye. Or here's the 17-year-old bourbon. Or here's Van Winkle 13-year rye. You know, all of those. And of course, and not all of it was, you know, super aged. I mean, he, the first thing I remember him tasting me on was Dickel number eight. Cause he's like, this is just a great everyday drinking whiskey, you know, on ice on a hot day. But the nice thing when you develop your palate, like even if I'm making this up, I don't know if you guys are wine guys, but you, you guys have spent so much time tasting bourbon. I'm sure you don't taste beer like somebody else would, or you don't taste wine like someone else would, or you're used to paying attention to things. So I was just blown away by the quality relative to the price of these bottles. And as you guys know, I mean, back in that time, like vintage 23 year rye was like a $58 bottle, you know, it, it was all super accessible. And I'm like, how much does this bottle cost? Yeah. They Elijah Craig 18 was like, then. yeah. So I think I had a really unique experience with bourbon because I was tasting, tasting, tasting wine and tasting a lot of really expensive wine and then was really blown away by the affordability and the quality of, of bourbon and rye. Yeah. That was uh, definitely during so the times when I wouldn't say that's the time I got into it. It was, it was probably a few years after that, but yeah, I mean, those are bottles that now we look on and be like, we'll never see that day ever again. Correct. Yeah. And that's the irony to me too, right? Is the thing that got me into bourbon was a combination of loving the taste of it. But also I was like, how cool is this? Sometimes you open these wines that are two grand and they don't really deliver. How cool is it that this $50 bottle really delivers like that? That's what really grabbed me. And so interestingly that, so that same friend 
was partners with my wife in her Spanish restaurant. He owned the building. So he was a silent partner and he had another building in Brooklyn. And he asked if I want, at this point, I'm, I was working at Blue Water Grill as a sommelier. And he asked if I would like to open a restaurant with him. And I think at that point I'd even figured out for myself, I was like, you know, I'm not really like, I don't want to be a sommelier for the rest of my life. You know, I thought about maybe trying to achieve the master sommelier, like passing two more levels, but it wasn't really that interesting to me. I got to taste all the great wines. She's having the salmon. I'm having the chicken. We'd like a red. Which one do you recommend? You know, it's like, it's at some point it's not that interesting. And I think I get bored pretty easily. And I really was excited about the idea of bringing my own restaurant to life you know, living in New York at the time, but my wife is from New Orleans. So I'd spent time in New Orleans around getting to know kind of Southern culture and food. And my friend, his only caveat was we have to, these, all these bottles are taking up too much room in my house. They need to be on the shelf of this restaurant. You can open a French bistro if you like, but like, we're going to carry all this bourbon. <laughs> and he had scotch, Japanese, like all the other stuff. I have a feeling like so, we would all be good friends because we have yeah. that same exact problem of bottles just kind of cluttering the, the basement floors. Yeah. And so we've just got to figure out a way to do something with it. A way that we can and try it his... and sell it at the same time. Yeah. So really the short story was I decided, well, I love bourbon too. Let's lean into this thing. And so the name of the restaurant was called Char Number 4. And it opened in September of 2008. And really the concept of the restaurant was it's an American whiskey bar and restaurant with the menu of the smoked, grilled and charred flavors that have an affinity for bourbon. I hired a chef who'd worked for Daniel Belud for 10 years, but was from Texas and had got tired of fine dining. We were making our own bacon. We were making our own sausage. We had a smoker. It wasn't like a pure barbecue restaurant. And the restaurant just it's just one of those things in life. Like, the, I mean, GQ named us one of the three best places to drink bourbon in America. Although, as I like to joke at that time, there were five places, so it wasn't like super competitive, <laughs> but we were Esquire 50 best bars in America, but we were also New York magazine, 10 best new restaurants in all of New York because the food was so good. So I think we really and we were the only restaurant in Brooklyn. So that was before Brooklyn had sort of become this like handlebar mustache, rooftop garden suspenders, and you know, this cliche of, of Brooklyn. And we were the only casual restaurant on the list. And we we're the only Brooklyn restaurant on the list. And I think the fact that the restaurant was very sophisticated, but not fancy, but also that the food was at a really high level. I just think it put bourbon in a different context. It wasn't this, you know, a leather chair and a cigar, and it wasn't a dive bar. It was basically the idea of a wine bar, but with bourbon and rye in the place of wine, where you could eat really excellent food. And I think the one thing, I say this with a little hesitance, but I just don't remember seeing it anywhere else. I think we were maybe the first ones to offer everything as a one ounce taste or a two ounce pour, because I'd seen that at one of my favorite restaurants, Gramercy Tavern in New York, offered wine as a three ounce taste or a six ounce glass. And so when you walked into the restaurant, the only thing you could see was this wall of American whiskey. We had vodka, gin, rum, tequila in the well. We had other whiskeys from around the world in drawers. The cocktail menu was only American whiskey. And we just leaned into it. And I remember thinking like, of course, I'd put together a nice short wine list. We had good beer. People could order a martini if they wanted. But because I remember thinking, I don't know if anyone's going to want to drink the bourbon, right? Because I, I, it, it, I hadn't really seen that be a thing. And as it turned out, I just think our timing was excellent. Just out of pure dumb luck. We're just, people were coming in, just trying all the different things. and. You know, as the other thing I'll point out to people, right, about that time, I bought, it was an unedited selection because in order to fill the shelves at a time where there's one Maker's Mark, one Basil Hayden, one Knob Creek, et cetera, et cetera, I literally had to buy every bourbon and rye American whiskey in existence just to fill the shelves. So there was no sense of, oh, I'm picking the things I like. The idea was when you sat at that bar and you looked at that wall, it was essentially an encyclopedic selection of all the 
whiskey that was readily available in distribution in the United States of America, plus, you know, all of these rare bottles that were consigned to the, to the restaurant. I went to Rutgers in New York. We travel up to New York all the time and I graduated there 2008, 2009, and there was zero bourbons. And being a Kentucky yeah. boy, I would try to, because when I go to the stores or the shelves, you know, maybe Makers and Jim Beam and Jack, that's it. And when I try to bring up bourbons, they're like, no, I don't want that stuff. I want like Crown or, you know, Scotch. Yeah. And it, it was not very well received. So it had to be a pretty risky endeavor, I guess, 2010 to be like, all right, we're going to do this in Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, like what makes yeah, you think it was, that it this was could be a possibility? Yeah, it was 2008. And yeah, and it was definitely, I mean, as I was saying, I really remember thinking maybe nobody is going to want to drink or be interested in tasting all of these different bourbons and rice. And maybe it'll just be a restaurant with really good food and people order beer and wine and, you know, a cocktail. So yeah, I, I was very aware that maybe the whole, I, I think I felt, I felt really confident in how the restaurant looked. I felt really confident about the food and I knew that people could have a great experience irrespective of the whiskey. So from that standpoint, I thought we'd succeed regardless, but I did feel like the whiskey aspect of it could be a total flop. <laughs> well, it's a good thing it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other kind of question with that as well is, you know, 2008, like you're going into the, the first crisis, like uh, housing market and everything like that, stock yeah. market's tanking. So yeah. at some point you might've been thinking, well, this is probably the worst time to open a new business. Yeah, it was, it was a scary time. Lehman Brothers had collapsed like three weeks before or like three weeks after the restaurant opened. My first daughter was born three weeks before. So it was definitely a scary time. But I think where we got lucky was twofold. One, irrespective of the crisis, it had been geared to being a really affordable restaurant in terms of food. The other decision that I made was that I was going to price everything at the same cost of goods sold irrespective of the bottle cost. And as you guys know, there was so much cheap stuff back then. So there were all these things you could drink for $2 an ounce. Oh, right. Wow. So Kentucky gentleman was $1 an ounce, but like Evan Williams, black label would be $2. And then Elijah Craig, 12 year, it was the 12 year single barrel at the time was $4 an ounce. And Elijah Craig 18 was $8 an ounce. And you guys, I mean, you, you've been around it for a while, so you would understand. So across these hundreds of whiskeys, someone could come in I mean, think about even something like probably Evan Williams single barrel was $3 an ounce. So we had a really good chopped pork sandwich on the menu that was $14. So someone could buy like a really good chopped pork sandwich with a side of beans and side of, you know, house made pickles and then try five different bourbons and probably walk out the door for 24 bucks. So I think we were, it was the perfect concept for the time yeah. as well. And then I think too, it's hard to know you know, to connect all the dots, but I think people get in a recessionary mindset and it makes them think of the twenties and, you know, like makes them think of that era where whiskey was, was really popular. Um, so I think those, you know, it was a lot of factors, but I think all those things really fed into each other. I mean, it was the amount of press we got, and, but then mo most importantly, it was just an incredibly busy restaurant that people loved. Like I'll still meet people all across the country be like, Oh my God, I love chart number four. Like that was my favorite restaurant ever. Um, and it was really, I mean, it was a neighborhood too. So it was really a great neighborhood restaurant. And then we were getting people coming from New Jersey and all over from Manhattan because we were kind of the only game in town and all the big guys in the whiskey world would, you know, Drew would come to my restaurant all the time and, you know, and, and Jimmy Russell and Tom Bullitt and all these people, because, that was the only place you could really go in the entire city. That was this homage and celebration of American whiskey. Quick research kind of shows, you know, you're, you're, you had a pretty long life with it. So it closed in the summer of 2015, kind of talk about the, you know, the time there and sort of what led to, to that and sort of going on to the next venture. Yeah. So, well, it's twofold also, right? So I opened two more restaurants in the same vein, one called Maysville in Manhattan, which opened in 2012, which got a glowing two-star review from Pete Wells, who's still the food critic for the New York Times. And then additionally, in 2015, opened a restaurant called Kenton's in, in New Orleans, which was named Best New Restaurant 
in New Orleans that year by New Orleans Magazine. So I kind of continued in that same vein. But then in between that, in 2010, I was having dinner with two friends of mine who are not in the industry who love bourbon. And we just got to having one of those conversations over too many drinks about how much opportunity there was to do something unique and different in the space. And that we were just more than anything, we weren't seeing an opportunity. It's not that I could really see, oh, bourbon's going to become huge. It was just more, we could do something different and cool. And also just being interested, I think, as you all know, there was so much less information back then. So the suppliers didn't really give you anything. You're like, oh, and they're like, oh, the Rick House has microclimates, limestone filtered water. You know, there wasn't a lot of information. 51% so we were also, checkbox. 51%. Done. Yeah. It's just like, they weren't really, there was no real explanation or understanding of like what, what it was all about. So the other excitement was like, I wonder if we could get our hands on some barrels and be able to taste them and taste them over time and see how different they are and all that type of stuff. Because you're also, so, this is also the point where probably barrel selections are just becoming like, I wouldn't say popular, but people are starting to kind of know about them around this time. Were, were you doing them as a part of the restaurant scene there? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone. Transform your tablet into a point of sale system or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Barrel selections are just becoming... Like, I wouldn't say popular, but people are starting to kind of know about them around this time. Were, were you doing them as a part of the restaurant scene there? No, I remember that certainly picks weren't big, obviously, the way they are now. But I remember someone like I remember Buffalo Trace being like, oh, do you want to do a single barrel of Buffalo Trace? And I was just like, I don't really understand how I'm supposed to hold $10,000 worth of it. Like, it doesn't really do me any good. Like, it wasn't that interesting to me. Yeah, I don't need uh, 200 bottles of this right now. Yeah. It's not, it's not helping me. And like, why would I hold that inventory? So yeah. So I wasn't doing any picks. So I wasn't getting to have that experience of, Oh, the, look how different all these barrels are from each other. And, but I had this idea, right. Which is still the core of what we do. And it ties back to wine. And that's why I think a lot of what we're all about was just, it was about, a, it's about a perspective. The thing that threw me off about bourbon was that it was all being made as a homogenous product. So if you think about wine, only crap wine is made that way. <laughs> like real wine is made as a vintage and it's made as like, that's how the gra grapes grew that year. And what's interesting about it is the variation from vintage to vintage. And the only wines that are made to be homogenous are these mass market, like supermarket wines, right? So it wasn't like I was thinking, oh, bourbon's not really made well, but my thought was, why can't we make vintages of bourbon? Like, why, why can't? we look at it like wine and say every year, we're just going to make the best bourbon we can. And the, there'll be vintage variation. 
So that was the original idea behind Pinhook and still the core of what we do that I think is the most distinct perspective that we have. And so, I mean, the other thing that is was interesting that most people wouldn't understand is I owned a bourbon bar and I was in it all the time and I had never heard of MGP, which was LD. It was Lawrenceburg Distillers at the time, but that wasn't common knowledge, right? I was just starting to learn some things like, oh, you know, Bullet is actually distilled at Four Roses, right? But Four Roses doesn't make rye. So then when Bullet wanted to do rye, they had to get it from somewhere else. Like I, I was just starting to understand that Kentucky Bourbon Distillers was didn't have a distillery. As you all might remember, that's when Templeton had their snafu, for lack of a better word. Yeah. You know, this is definitely a time so, when more transparency was starting to come out. And you were definitely part of that old guard that was trying to figure out exactly where where does this all stuff come from, which yes. is weird because today people hang their hat on it. They want to know. They want to know the source. They want right. to figure out where it's come from. So it was a lot different back then. Yeah, it was it was really different. And, you know, eventually I figured out that there was this place called LDI and that you could pick up the phone and order 20,000 barrels or 2,000 barrels or in our case, 20 barrels. So Pinhook was founded in 2011. We bought 20 barrels of MGP, the 7521 4 three-year-old bourbon for $465 a barrel. And those <laughs> good days, right? <laughs> yeah, those were good days. days. And at the time you couldn't visit MGP. So obviously our whole thing is that we wanted to get our hands on the barrel. Also, I think the thing, and I still think this is true, but in our heads, we're like, we want to hang out in Kentucky. Like this is our excuse. Like we're going to send our barrels to Kentucky and that will give us an excuse. And also we thought we were pretty smart that three friends had created a bourbon business that would, you know, we would be able to tell our wives like, Hey, we got to go to Kentucky, you know, check in on the barrels. And so we, we thought we were pretty smart and the only person, I mean, this is also indicative of the time and you guys know how many different people bottle and, you know, obviously there are companies like Bardstown at the sort of extreme level of doing contract distillation and bottling for so many different brands. The only people we could find was strong spirits in Bardstown. To my knowledge, they were like the only game in town, a place where you could store your stuff. And they had a little bottling line and Michter's was being bottled there at the time. I think Angel's Envy was being bottled there at the time. I remember showing up there to check on our palletized 20 barrels and seeing like, oh, there's some Angel's Envy in a, you know, in, in a port cask or something. And so, you know, storage was a dollar per barrel per month. So, you know, we started the company for $9,000 in barrel acquisition and $240 a year in storage. And then really just spent the next three years visiting Kentucky, you know, four, five, six times a year, checking in on our barrels in Bardstown, knocking around with Justin Thompson and just visiting other distillery, you know, just really soaking it all up. And all the while, you know, we had this idea. The only thing we knew is we were going to be transparent. We didn't want to have a distillery. We were only interested in blending, which if you know, wine is very common. It's they call it a negotiant in wine is that idea. It's like, I don't grow grapes. I just want to buy either grapes or buy wine from other people. And then I'm going to be in charge of maturation and blending. Right. And we want to be completely clear that that's what we do. And we're proud of it. So one of my co-founders, his best friend from high school, this guy, Jamie Hill grew up in thoroughbred horse racing. His dad was a vet at the track for the New York racing association. And we would always stay at Jamie's house. And when we weren't doing the bourbon thing, we would do the horse thing, not with any particular eye towards folding that into what, you know, the brand, but just because there was nothing else to do. So we would go to Keeneland, go to Churchill, go to horse farms, wake up early to watch horses breeze at Keeneland, all that type of stuff. And Jamie was explaining a big part of his business, which is called pin hooking, which, you know, you all might know most people don't, if they don't live in Kentucky, but in thoroughbred horse racing, a pin hook is when you buy a baby thoroughbred based on its lineage to sell it, hopefully for a profit when it's mature. So you buy something young to sell it when it's mature. And we just connected the dots or like, that's really cool. That's what we're doing. We're pin hooking bourbon. And we love the idea that when you explain the name, you're explaining to people what we do and being completely transparent about it. Jamie also has a racing stable that already existed called bourbon lane stable. 
And he was naming every single horse in his stable with bourbon in the name. And he just did that because he loved bourbon and he thought it would be fun marketing for his stable that if you saw a bourbon horse racing anywhere in the world, you would know it was a bourbon lane horse. So I'm sure as you guys can imagine, that's where all the pieces came together. And we're like, well, Pinhook, that's a kind of a cool name. It sounds like a thing. I'll have a Pinhook on the rocks. I'll have a Pinhook old fashioned. It explains what we do. It's transparent. We have this idea of doing vintages. And so the final piece was we asked Jamie, would you pick an unproven thoroughbred each year to be the horse for the vintage? And to us, the point of that and the authenticity of it was it's not a champion, you know, thoroughbred horse racing. It's like how many D1 college football players make it to the NFL? Like it mostly doesn't go well, but we want it to be authentic. And the authenticity is that Jamie's going to pick a horse that probably will not be a champion thoroughbred, let alone run in the Kentucky Derby. But that's what marks each vintage. And I think the point of the horses as much of anything was to create a signal to people that every year it's something different. And so I don't know if y'all have looked at the bottles, but every year there's also a new geometry. The geometry is based off of jockey silks. And the idea too, is that every year, all of the bottles in a given vintage have the same geometry so that if you put five, if you took one of our SKUs and looked and put five different vintages together, not only do they all have a vintage date on them, not only do they all have a different horse on them, but they also have a different shape because I was also seeing that people were starting to get into collecting, but the, to me, the collecting didn't seem very fun because all the bottles look the same. So that was part of it as well. The other thing I should mention too, cause I always, I, I think I forget to give him enough credit, but my other co-founder designed all of our packaging. So that was his background. And so, you know, without being corny, I think it was one of those truly amazing thing where three good friends who had three unique skill sets all came together and we did the entire thing ourselves. We never hired, you know, anyone to help us with design. We never hired anyone to help us with the naming or the marketing. You know, we truly just, you know, got after it ourselves. You know, Sean, you know, they call that, they call that a trifecta. <laughs> that <laughs> exactly we did hit the trifecta with this one so 2014 we released our first pin hook bottling i think it was 15 barrels the packaging was different at the time the letters the sorry the labels were letter pressed every six months we were doing a new horse there was no geometry at the time it was just a plain white label with letter pressed but the wax color was different for each one as you can imagine, we had no notion of scale. <laughs> and how would you like, how yep. would this thing like, that doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it made sense to us at the time, but also we weren't thinking about scaling. We were just really excited about, I mean, it, you all know this cause you've done it as well. I don't think, and you guys were way more, you know, in the industry through your, th you know, through the podcast and all these different ways before you even released your first product. I had this bourbon bar, but I didn't feel remotely like an insider. And so that moment when you see your bottle on a shelf, you know, at a retail shop or, you know, like I was friends with the sommelier at Gramercy Tavern and they brought an, you know, pretty iconic legendary restaurant to see a bottle of our bourbon on the back bar at Gramercy Tavern, you're just like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like we actually did this thing and now it's on shelves and out in the world and people are drinking it. There was still no Instagram or at least not in a real way. So we weren't, we didn't get to see it come to life in that way, but just to know that people were buying it and had it in their homes just seemed like an amazing thing. No, it, yeah, it is definitely, it, it is very gratifying and rewarding because you're like putting all this risking all this, putting myself out there, throwing blends out. <laughs> Are people going to buy it? Are they going to try it? Are they going to like it? It's, I didn't realize how insecure I was until we started a bourbon brand. And, uh, yeah, I'm very insecure as I've, as I found out. So, but I was, I always was curious about the, you know, the packaging and the different colors. Cause it would, it would, I guess kind of sometimes confuse me as a consumer like, all right, yes. what do they all mean? You know, this and that, but that, that's a helpful explanation. And, I yes. think it's the way we looked at it. I mean, we hardly invented it, right? It's just, it takes time to educate. I mean, sure. Johnny Walker maybe being the best example with the different colors or the different labels. And so in some ways I think it's easy because it's color coded. Orange is our everyday bourbon. 
Green is our everyday rye and magenta is our cask strength bourbon. Those are kind of the three core products. And so it's just a matter of, I mean, you guys know this because you released, you know, different iterations and, you know, at some point you've got to get people to understand like what's what. But I think the colors, because they're so bright and they stand out so much can also confuse people for sure. But I feel like the longer we've been around, the more people are, you know, are learning. Talk about the whiskey itself. Like what's obviously you start with MGP, but I know you all are at Castle and Key and this and that. So like, are, is it like a combination of both or are you training or what's the future for the, the liquid in the bottle? Yeah. So the, the dumb luck continued with it's Jamie's friend, Will Arvin. They'd been friends for 25 years who bottled Taylor. So we were the first people they approached at that point. We were just distributed in Kentucky and New York and Louisiana. Cause I had moved to Louisiana and you know, it was, it really was as simple. And it was also Wes at the time as well. Right. It was as simple as them being like, Hey fellas, we bought this <laughs> distillery. And like a lot of people, we had like scrambled under the fence and you know, it looks like the zombie apocalypse and you know, and they're, and we're like, wow. Okay. And they have no, it, we were talking to them at the very, very beginning, right? They had no idea. They hadn't even started the process of like looking for a, a distiller, right? They're just like, Hey, we're doing this thing. What do you think about Pinhook is made here? And we're like, great. <laughs> we're, we're in. <laughs> see you in 10 years. I, <laughs> see, yeah. I was like, sounds good. I will say though, the most important aspect of that, it felt like such a fortuitous opportunity that that was actually when we decided, or we had to decide, are we doing this for real or is this just a side project? And so that's actually when we ended up in acquiring a significant amount of MGP because the thought process was, all right, if we really want to build a brand and we're going to have this moment where we get to release our custom Kentucky distillate from the restored old Taylor distillery, no one knew what the name was going to be. We need to start establishing our brand. In a, we, ha, we need to have a broader footprint. So we bought a lot of MGP with the idea that we're going to spend the next, you know, three to four years bottling MGP, but scaling up. That's when we realized like, we actually have to create categories. We can't just like keep bottling a different wax color every six months. That's not going to work. So that was a huge moment. And then 2020 was our first release. So I always thought it was surprising, but Castle and Key never stipulated that they had to be the first ones to release Castle and Key. So we actually released Castle and Key before they did. <laughs> Whoops. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we released our first rye in 2020 and then followed by the bourbon. And so the thing that we did, you all might not be familiar with it, but I was trying to think of something fun to do with the remaining MGP barrels and all the bourbon barrels and rye barrels we bought were essentially the same age. They weren't quite the same lot, but I want to say like maybe they're two months apart at most on, in terms of the fill dates. And we bought it all when it was maybe 14 months old and immediately moved it all to Castle and Key to age. So I was kind of thinking about, okay, it's no longer going to be part of our core, but we need to do something really fun with it that feels limited and also doesn't feel like it has anything to do with the core product. And the idea that I came up with is based on wine and in wine, a vertical is when you go into a restaurant and they have, you know, the same producer and every vintage for a series of vintages with no gaps. The big difference with wine is that it ages significantly and transforms in the bottle. Whereas obviously bourbon for all practical purposes is kind of frozen in time. So the idea I came up with was when all the barrels are four years old, We'll take a little chunk of the barrels and we'll do a blend and we'll release a four-year age statement. This is our gold wax bourbon. The remaining barrels stay behind. A year later, all the barrels are five years old. You take a chunk of the barrels, do a blend, leave the rest of the barrels behind. So it's a nine-year series that follows the barrels as they age from four to 12 years old. And it culminates with a 12-year bourbon in 2027 and a 12-year 95.5 rye in 2028. So it's been a really fun, the eight year is about to come out in the fall and the bourbon, vertical bourbon is a fall release and vertical rise is spring release. And it's been incredibly fun. I mean, I think it's getting to the point where, you know, like I think what would be fun to do with you all, I'm not even saying this like related to a podcast is like, let's blind taste four, five, six, seven, eight, and put them out of order 
and try to put them in chronological order in terms of age. But I think it's, I mean, it's also getting more and more tasty. So it's really meant to be also delicious whiskey, not just an experiment. But the last one was bottled at cast strength at 115. All the barrels are dropping proof at, at C&K. So, you know, barrel entry 120 and the blend was 115 at cast strength. So how, how long do you think you'll have enough whiskey to keep it going? Well, well, that's what I mean. We, we've, I've mapped it out with the idea that the barrel, the dumps will increase each year to kind of keep production even and account for evaporation. And so the idea was, I like the idea of doing it ages four through 12, because I feel like that used to be considered the window. I mean, I certainly think that bourbon and rye can be enjoyed younger than four if it's, you know, blended correctly. And we all know there's whiskey north of 12, but I think historically that was kind of considered to be the window is age four to 12. So I think that's a fun way to look at it. And then it's fun to be able to do like, I mean, certainly what I'm noticing so far is I think it would be way harder to put the rye in chrono chronological order than the bourbon. Oh, it yeah. just doesn't, it just doesn't, as you guys know, it doesn't showcase the age as much, but even that would be a fun thing. It's like, all right, how much is more time in wood affecting bourbon compared to rye? And it's, it's probably for me, the most fun thing I do every year because I haven't tasted the whiskey for a year. So it's, you know, I, I don't, I intentionally don't check in on it and I'll just wait until it's time to do the blend and then pull the samples. And it's always a, a lot of fun. Well, are you still trying to make your pilgrimage to Kentucky to, to do your, your sampling or are you, are you get the point now? Yeah, like, we do yeah, it just all. Just go ahead and get the samples and ship them to me here. Yeah, we do. You know, sir, obviously during COVID, I had them all shipped, but I always do the blending in Kentucky. We actually, Jamie's offices are in Midway. And so we kind of set up a little blending room there. Nothing fancy, but we have, you know, we have our DMA and, you know, our beakers and, you know, graduated cylinders, everything we need to do the blending. And so we'll just run to Castle and Key, pick up our samples. We've been bottling with KAD for a while. So some barrels are being stored there as well. So I'm in Kentucky a lot. In fact, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. So this is going to be more of a business related question. And you had said that you had opened up three markets. You're in New York, Kentucky, Louisiana. And at some point you said, we've got to figure out if we're going to make this a real business. So at what point did you say, all right, well, let's go all in with this. And did you exit out of your restaurants and leave them to somebody else? Are you still in them? And then, of course, I think one thing that we all have to worry about is what does our better half say? So what was your wife's thoughts on it as well? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So as I said, I mean, just from a mentality perspective, it was the castle and key opportunity where we're like, we have to we have to grow this or we have to take this opportunity and see this as a sign that we should turn this into a real business. But then, you know, I had at this point I'd opened three restaurants and I had seen the reality that you can have a restaurant that's doing incredibly well financially for a period of time. Char number four, I think part of it because of the success, we just had way more competition in a neighborhood that didn't have the density. So you see the numbers start to go down. Maysville, we opened in a neighborhood that was really underserved and we were crushing it for a period of time. We returned a significant amount of, you know, we made the full return to our investors with additional on top. And the New Orleans restaurant was the first one where we like came out of the gate really hot and the numbers weren't awesome. And so I was reaching that point where I was beginning to see that I was going to, if I was going to stay in the restaurant business, I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to be one restaurant ahead. Like it would just never end. Like you'd always have to anticipate that even a restaurant that's doing really, really well could suddenly not be doing really, really well. And all of a sudden you'd be up against it. So it was actually really easy in a way with my wife because she's also in the business. And we, at that point, collectively, you know, with her spot opening in 2004, been doing it for 10 plus years and really understanding what a challenge it was. And also knew enough to understand not about multiples and this and that, but that maybe there was something a little more stable, scalable and secure 
potentially about a bourbon business if it did well. So she was really all in on the idea of segueing out of the restaurants. You all know about the pesky three-tier system. So technically, I was not on Pinhook in the beginning. I knew I could trust my partners to let me on when the time was right. So I made the decision, you know, chart number four, we closed. And then that one, I didn't really have the option to sell because my partner owned the building and he wanted to do something else. Maysville, we sold to someone They opened an Italian restaurant. We sold our New Orleans restaurant to the chef, Alain Shia. It's now a really popular, well-known restaurant called Saba. So that was basically the moment where, and it didn't, I mean, anything is risky, but we had taken so many risks that I kind of felt like right out of the gate, I could at least pull a salary that would work for, it's not like it was some big number, but it's like allow us to continue to live our lives. So as much as I loved and still love restaurants. That was actually a very freeing moment because restaurants are really stressful in so many different ways. You have a lot of employees relative to the revenue. You just have constant problems. Things are always breaking. People are always quitting. And this is even before, and, you know, got super lucky that that all happened almost just right before COVID too. So it was pretty great timing. And, and that really happened. So in the fall of 2017, up until COVID, I spent three years being the only salesperson and just traveling 35 weeks out of the year. And you, you all know what it is. I, I see you guys doing the, the, the tastings and the education and the bottle signings. And, and then there's obviously just selling, you know, trying to sell directly to the accounts. And at that point we were in maybe 12 or 13 States. So I was just bouncing all around. The biggest shift was the amount of travel. Yeah. It's definitely just away. Yeah. You know, just away from the family, always around on the weekends for the most part, but you know, it's a lot. And as you know, too, like traveling, traveling can be a grind, right? I mean, I think people see it and they're always like, oh, look at you going to these cool restaurants and oh, it must be fun. You're in LA and you know, and it is to a degree, but you know, you're also logging a lot of hours and you know, lifts and Ubers and sales reps, cars and airplanes and all that good stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you're entertaining all the time and, and I don't take it for granted. I love this stuff, but it's like, you're entertaining, you're up late, you're drinking, you know, you're trying to do work while ride alongs with distributors and doing events. It's it takes a toll on you for sure. I don't think people understand that. Oh yeah. Until you're in it. No. Yeah. And it's, I think the one thing maybe performance seems like the wrong word, but you do have to be on, right? And so you have to be on for everyone, on for the consumers who are excited to, about your brand and to meet you. You have to be on for the sales reps because it's your opportunity to get them excited, you know, to get your distributor behind you, you know, because you're also really competing with all of the other brands in their portfolio. I think it's pretty simple, but it's realistic to say the more they like you, maybe the more you have an edge when they're out there selling. And so, yeah, you just constantly have to, you know, it must be a little bit like a Broadway show, right? I was never an actor, but you gotta, (laughs) you gotta turn it, you gotta turn it on and you gotta keep it on. And some days that means nine hours in a car where you're like on with the, you know, you're on with the sales rep in a way, right? You want to be engaging and it's your opportunity to educate them and get to know them. And then you're popping into all these accounts and then maybe you're doing a bottle signing or, you know, some sort of consumer tasting or, you know, meeting up with a bunch of other buyers and you just have to just keep going and then do it again. It never stops. It's a carousel of constantly going and everything like that too. But, you know, Sean, I I do want to say thank you again for coming on the show sharing your story, your background. I think it's an amazing, it's it's like we just listened to the Who Lose the Bear, but in real life, like, I feel like that's what just happened. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating story. Great story. I feel like, well, yeah, I, we could spend a ton of time together with all the food and wine and bourbon and all the things we have going on right now. It's be, I'd love to continue this conversation at another time. Yeah, me too. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity because to be honest, I I don't know if it's about the timing of when we started, or maybe it's that in a way the bottles themselves would be easy not to dismiss. I think people like the packaging, but it's kind of like, oh, bourbon and horses. And if you don't know, I think we're one of those brands where if you don't know the story behind it, you could almost just, 
I wouldn't say write it off, but just be like, oh yeah, they've got a pretty bottle and they put a horse on it. Cause you know, everyone knows animals help sell, you know, <laughs> products, but everything. And it's the thing I'm most proud of is every single thing on that bottle. Every detail came from a lot of time spent really thinking about what we wanted to contribute to the world of bourbon. And I, I think about with, um, like with restaurants, the amazing thing about restaurants is when you open a restaurant, you're saying, I want to be part of this conversation of what does it mean to have a great restaurant? And you have your own approach to the, the food and the service and everything. And then when you become a part of that, it's a really cool thing. And that was the same goal with Penhook. We wanted like, wow, how cool would it be to one day be a brand along with all these other brands on the shelves and be part of this conversation around like what makes great bourbon and that people are excited about it. But yeah, like I said, I think it's maybe dismiss is too strong a word, but sometimes I think people are like, oh, I've seen it. It's the bright colors with all the horses. And you know, that doesn't mean you have to like it, but I think when people hear what's behind it, I generally feel like people are like, oh, wow, what a interesting and unusual path we had to getting to where we are. Oh, totally. I, I think this has definitely enlightened me and to your story because, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that people, you see the, the word Kentucky bourbon or just bourbon in, uh, with horses and it just seems synonymous. But what you have built is definitely something that's, that's truly interesting. It's unique and it's a story that I'm glad we could capture and share with our audience because I'm sure that people are going to understand it now. And when they go to their local liquor store and they see the magenta and the orange wax and everything else, they go, ah, I get it now. Yep. But Sean, if people want to follow you, learn more about Pinhook, anything like that, how can they do it? So Pinhook Bourbon is just, you know, on Instagram at Pinhook Bourbon and of course, PinhookBourbon.com. I am hashtag dot bourbon spelled out. It was actually the name of our third horse. There was a horse named hashtag bourbon. So I wasn't on Instagram. And when I thought about being on Instagram, I'm like, well, that's a cool name for you know, a, a handle and somehow it wasn't taken. So that's where I do all, you know, and all the kind of show where I am traveling wise. And also I love to cook. So I do a lot of cooking stuff as well. Very awesome. Very cool. Well, so make sure you follow pin hook, make sure you definitely follow hashtag bourbon. I do it as well because I like to follow along and see what Sean's doing there. But if you like the show, share it with a friend, leave a review. And now you know exactly what wax tailors look like when you go across the store shelves. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. Toodles. Toodles.